Imagine living in a world where it's dangerous just to drive your car from one town to another, where there's no guarantee you'll have a place to stay, even if you have the money to pay for it, where it's dangerous to simply walk into a restaurant to order lunch. For African Americans in the United States during segregation, they didn't have to imagine. It was their reality. And to cope with the racism they encountered, black Americans relied on something called the Green Book. From the early 1900s until the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the safest way for black Americans to travel was the Green Book, a travel guide that detailed the restaurants, hotels, barbershops, and stores that were safe for African American travels. But what is the story behind the Green Book? Who is the man who published it? And how did the Green Book shape car culture for black Americans? Today on Pass Gas, we're talking about the Green Book and the African American experience, culture, and history with cars in the US. With the United States' dark past of segregation, how did black people even buy cars? Were there African-American car makers competing with Henry Ford in the early days? You bet there were. Buckle up and get out before sundown. This is Past Gas. Past Gas Podcast. It's about cars, it's not about Ford. Big thanks to Valvoline for sponsoring this episode of Past Gas. Did you guys know that Valvoline is the original motor oil? Not only were they the first patented motor oil brand, they've also had many firsts in the industry. How many other motor oil brands can you say that about? Some of those firsts include the first high mileage oil, the first synthetic blend, and the first racing oil. And since the 1860s, they have never stopped innovating. They're constantly reinventing formulas to provide the ultimate protection for every engine on the road today. In fact, every motor oil Valvoline makes has recently been reformulated to provide 40% better wear protection than industry standards. Valvoline has proven to maximize engine life by fighting the four main causes of engine breakdown. Those are heat, friction, wear, and deposits. Another reason we love Valvoline? They're synonymous with some of the racing greats like Mark Martin, Cale Yarborough, AJ Foyt, and Chase Elliott. I use Valvoline in my car every time I change the oil. It's reliable, it's great, it's the best oil out there. And I'm not saying that just because they're paying us. So do yourself a favor and make sure you choose Valvoline. Head over to valvoline.com slash original to find the right oil for your engine. Thank you, Valvoline. Yeah, man. It's hard, it's hard to joke after an intro like that. Yeah, pretty heavy intro to come yeah. into this with. Welcome to Past Gas. I'm Nolan Sykes, your host, joined by my other two hosts. We got Joe Weber. No catchphrase today. And James Pumphrey. It doesn't matter who we are. What matters is our plan. No one cared who I was until I put on the mask. <laughs> Did you watch Dark Knight Rises last night? I watched Dark Knight Rises every night. <laughs> every night. <laughs> yeah. Every night is part of my routine. Um... Was this a thing for you guys? Were guys uh, really obsessed with the with like the Tom Hardy Bane aesthetic when that movie came out? I think you hung out with like a lot a beefier crowd than we did. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> we were we were friends with a bunch of skinny comedians, so it was more of just like doing bits to hide our insecurity <laughs> over how. <laughs> skinny we were uh compared to tom hardy makes sense okay so we never got super into like being fanboys for sure okay that makes sense makes or sense. fat <laughs> yeah yeah I mean, there's fat. also fat ones yep just very very few yoked ones well the great yeah. thing about bane is that he has like high-waisted pants so like if you're a fat guy you can just pull those pants up over your belly button <laughs> and it makes it look like you're you you have like a big midsection because you've been doing a lot of deadlifting yeah. but really you've just been eating cheese puffs and if some... you're if you're a strong guy in comedy you have to be like super intense like like rob riggle because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. it doesn't look good when you're like you have a super tight shirt and your veins are bulging out of your muscles and you're doing scene work where you're like knitting <laughs> 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 you got to be like screaming yeah there's this dude Stephen hale who's uh in like he was in a sketch group back in the day and he was yoked and all he would do is just scream <laughs> but they can sell it i yeah. can't sell it there's a time when all i i mean i still that's so, i kind of <laughs> oh sort of you mean yeah that's true two years ago <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
All right, so I'm really excited to do this episode. I think it's always fun to do more like history deep dives like this. Uh, this is more like our... It, it's not going to be like one continuous story like some of our other episodes, but more like our anthology, if you will, like our uh, 80s and 90s supercar episodes where we'll, we'll have separate smaller stories that kind of make a bigger picture of how African-Americans had to essentially make their own car culture within the United States um, in spite of all the um, challenges that they came up against, all the all the racism that they came up against and how their own car culture flourished. So I'm really stoked to get into this. Yeah. I think in the entertainment world, they call it vignettes. Yes, vignettes. These Think of this as vignettes. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Do you know like on Instagram when you... When you drag the slider over and you pull the shadows in from the outside, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah that's exactly. Yet. Yeah. All right. Let's do it. Before we talk about anything else, we need to understand what led to African Americans' needs for their own car culture, separate from white car culture. What is it that led to the creation of the Green Book? And why did black Americans have such a difficult time traveling in the United States? How did oppressive laws and Jim Crow era violence lead to the rise of black automobile owners. Before the civil rights movement, the United States was mostly segregated, and many states had Jim Crow laws that had come into effect in the late 1800s after the Civil War. This meant between 1890 and 1960, it was especially dangerous for African Americans to travel. Jim Crow laws made it so whites could be rude and outright violent towards black travelers with little to no consequences. The fact that public transportation was segregated and often dangerous for African Americans meant the invention of the car was also a source of independence. As it so often is across ages and cultures, for black Americans, the automobile represented the ultimate freedom from the harsh realities of a segregated society. But of course, there was a downside for traveling by car. Because of segregation, it was difficult to find hotels, restaurants, and mechanics who would serve African Americans, and often dangerous to travel in certain areas of the United States. W.E.B. Du Bois, the famous civil rights activist, was among the many black Americans who preferred to travel by car. He saw it as a way for black Americans to have more freedom of travel, and the independence that came with driving in a car meant fighting against Jim Crow laws. Said Du Bois, quote, the only discrimination that we chanced upon was one at which we heartily laugh. A fill station on the Jacksonville Daytona Road had a sign, quote, for white trade only. We passed it four times and saw not a single person there. These crackers persist in being fools, said my companion. Despite the obvious absurdity of the situation, segregated businesses presented a real problem for black travelers who needed to be able to find stops along the way gas stations, hotels, motels, and restaurants that would offer them services in safe harbor. But how do you find these places pre-internet? Well, that's where the Green Book came in. I don't know how they did, how anybody did anything pre-internet. I know. I was just looking. Some picture had like a bunch of encyclopedias in someone's house, and I was like, oh, yeah, we used to have encyclopedias. And I remember like, Oh, going, yeah, books. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa, hardcover? <laughs> uh, the Green Book and other similar books written at the time were travel guide books. Because of the Jim Crow laws and segregation, it was often very difficult for black Americans to find accommodation or restaurants that would serve them. The Green Book was meant to help. They would rate, review, and offer hotels, restaurants, lodging, and even gas stations that served black customers. The fact that a guidebook like this was needed is a testament to how bad things were in the U.S. during the Jim Crow era. Victor Hugo, the creator of the Green Book, said it best himself in an introduction to the guide, quote, There will be a day sometime in the near future when this guide will not have to be published. This is when we as a race will have equal opportunities and privileges in the United States. It will be a great day for us to suspend this publication, for then we can go wherever we please and without embarrassment. His full name was Victor Hugo Green, hence the Green Book. Yeah, the book wasn't green. Nothing about it was green? It might have been green. Well, I'm looking at uh, some Google images of the book, and it looks like it was green, but, uh, you know. Well, that's just good branding. Yeah. <laughs> 
If the name Victor Hugo sounds familiar, it's because Green, the author of the Green Book, was named after the famous French author of the same name. But before Victor Hugo Green created the self-named Green Book, he lived the experience of trying to travel as a black American during segregation. Victor Hugo Green was born in 1892 in New York City and grew up in Harlem. Green was an entrepreneur and a businessman. He fought in World War I and started his career as a postal worker, but quickly saw the need for a black travel guide. Let's get together and make motoring better, he wrote in a letter explaining his desire to put together what would later become the Green Book. Green married Alma Green, um, who I assume changed her name after they got married, who helped him with the researching and publishing of the Green Book. And when Victor Green retired in 1952, Alma took over the role as publisher and Victor stayed on as an advisor. That's cool. Amazingly, when Alma took over the Green Book in 1952, she had an all-woman staff who wrote, marketed, and distributed the Green Book out of their offices in Harlem. So, like, yeah, so there wasn't just one draft. You know what I mean? Like, there wasn't yeah, just one. it had one... to be continually updated. It had to be, yeah, continually updated, yeah. And I'm sure places closed and they had to update it. Uh-huh. And, so it was and... like Zagat's. Yeah. You know, like. <laughs> that's a reference that our audience will definitely get it's like Z- yeah. like you know how you guys all get zagats you get your zagats guide every does everyone year? Uh, sign up for the zagats newsletter every week yeah um yeah but yeah I think it, of, uh, people will understand like the michelin guide uh-huh yeah it was routinely updated um so it could stay current so um a woman running anything at the time was rare but a publishing company was unheard of Alma was a big part of the reason the Green Book succeeded while other similar travel books for African Americans folded. Green started the Green Book in 1936 with his partner, George L. Smith. The first issue was published the following year. When his business partner, Smith, died, Green's brother, William, came on board and started helping run the company. Green said he was inspired by Jewish travel guides to make the Green Book. Similar to black Americans at the time, Jewish travelers had to be cautious about where they could stay and travel because of discrimination. Turns out, we're just the worst. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Yeah. But unlike the guides that inspired the Green Book, Victor Green managed to make something that lasted a long time. The book was published from 1937 to 1966, with only a break for the four years during World War II. It's sad that it had to exist, but amazing that Green kept it going for decades. The Green Book was just the beginning for black car culture. The guidebook helped travelers feel safe driving around the United States. But what about other parts of black car culture? Was it difficult for black Americans to buy cars, to sell cars? Were there black owned car companies? Did Henry Ford have a little competition in Detroit? Although not always highlighted in the history books, black Americans made huge contributions to car design, racing, and manufacturing. I mean, what's before we move on, just thinking about this. They stopped publishing it in, in 1966, yeah. like 60 years ago, you know, not well, that I'm long. sure it could have gone on for a lot longer. Like it's there's I mean, there's still to this day towns that you, uh, you don't want to. I mean, they're, to st- they're still passing legislation to keep uh, black Americans from voting. Yeah, it's just under the surface a little bit more nowadays. But like, actually, it's bubbling to the surface, but there's still plenty of racism to go around yeah, it's oh like, yeah it's almost as if it's woven into the fabric of our country <laughs> yeah. It, it's yeah it's just it, it, it's just wild uh it's easy it's easy to imagine things that happened recently were so much further away because the media at the time was still using like black and white photography you know it doesn't it doesn't feel it as as close um mm-hmm. and you know something as simple as black and white film makes it so much easier to not uh, connect with that era, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, you look at, uh, yeah, that is kind of crazy to be like, it was so long ago. Let's move on. But literally it's just like 50 years is not long. You look at, you look at like NASCAR races from the early nineties and it looks like the seventies, like just video quality has gotten so much better that it makes it look like so much older. That 360p, uh, yeah. <laughs> Although Henry Ford reigned supreme as the foremost original car maker in the United States, there were actually many before him. One man named Charles Richard Patterson 
was the first black man to make cars. But what was his story, and how did a former slave start the first black-owned car company? Charles Richard Patterson was born in 1833 as a slave on a Virginia plantation. But around the 1850s, there are conflicting reports as to exactly when he escaped to Greenfield, Ohio. Once in Ohio, Patterson learned blacksmithing and worked as a carriage maker. By the 1870s, he had a reputation for building high-quality carriages. In 1873, he became business partners with another carriage maker, a white man named J.P. Lowe. By 1893, Patterson became the sole owner of the carriage company, and his son, Frederick Douglas Patterson, moved home to help him run C.R. Patterson and Sons. Oh, you want one of them Patterson carriages? High-quality Patterson. <laughs> Four wheels? Nice. I don't know how to describe a carriage. <laughs> I think you're you're right on. They have four wheels. I can never remember if carriages have four wheels or nine wheels. And then buggies, I think, have two wheels. So that's like a, a horse cart. Yes. That goes like that. Like a little chariot thing, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so you're right on. Four wheels, Joe. Good job. By 1900, the company had 28 different carriage designs and over 40 employees. A large company for that time. They were making about 500 horse-drawn carriages a year. When Charles Patterson died in 1910, his son Frederick took over the business. Frederick decided to get into the horseless carriage game. At first, the company did repairs for other makers of automobiles, doing repairs on mostly interiors and upholstery. But as the workers learned how these horseless carriages worked, C.R. Patterson was able to offer upgrades and repairs to the engines themselves. That's cool. They're like Gimbala. <laughs> sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Finally, in 1915, the first C.R. Patterson and Sons automobile was assembled. It was a two-door coupe. Frederick Patterson was known for his love of advertising and was a talented businessman. He posted advertisements for the new car and was clearly proud of what the company had made, saying, quote, our car is made with three distinct purposes in mind. It is not intended to be a large car. It is designed to take the place originally held by the family Surrey. It is a five-passenger vehicle, ample and luxurious. It is intended to carry with it, and it does so to perfection, every conceivable convenience and every luxury known to car manufacturers. There is absolutely nothing shoddy about it. Nothing skimp and stingy. Advertising back then was... Very way funny. more verbose yeah <laughs> yeah yeah there's a, like you those last two sentences you don't even need them mm -hmm. the last sentence is, is just like it to wrap it up it doesn't suck yeah <laughs> you didn't even have to say that now i'm <laughs> thinking that it actually kind of sucks <laughs> it might suck why'd you say that hey yeah why'd you yeah uh why are just, you getting defensive <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm just thinking about how like fast paced advertising is nowadays because all, all of our attention spans are so yeah. just blown out. But like this is a huge paragraph and maybe you're like walking. Is that how people were back then? They're just walking down the street and then they see an ad and they're like, I'm going to stop and read this whole thing for probably about 20 seconds. Well, people used to read books. Yeah. Yeah. The amount of words that we consume compared to back then is just like minuscule. <laughs> I don't know I, about that. <laughs> Dude, 100%. when's the last book you read? When, when I mean, did you? I, I read on the plane this weekend. You finished it? I did not finish it, but I did. It was a sample that I downloaded on my Kindle, and then I got home and downloaded it because it was so. I don't, man, that's the we're the sample generation. <laughs> yeah, we're the we sample can't generation. Even finish a whole book. I won't. E I don't even watch YouTube anymore because it's too long. I only watch TikTok. <laughs> that's. I can't. Uh, I. I. I well, one, you should watch YouTube because that's your job. I do. I do watch YouTube. <laughs> yeah, so advertising back then was... Pretty gnarly. Okay. Well, uh, C.R. Patterson's first cars sold for about $685, which is about twenty grand in today's money. Not bad. Not too shabby. Whoa, that's pretty cheap. The price of a new Ford Maverick. Yeah. Oh, I love that Maverick. Today, it is assumed that the Patterson Company built around 150 automobiles, but unfortunately, none have survived to the present day, which kind of sucks. I think I might, I might get a Maverick. I think you should. It's smaller than the Ranger? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. 
It's about the same size as a uh, old Ranger. It's, yeah, and yeah. it's only nineteen grand. Over the next several years, C.R. Patterson and Sons made a few different models of coupes and sedans. One of their most stylish cars was a speedster named Red Devil. Ooh, ah, ah. <laughs> <laughs> The cars were advertised as having a 30-horsepower continental four-cylinder engine, full-floating rear axle, cantilever springs, electric starting and lighting, and a split windshield for ventilation. The build quality of the Patterson cars was highly regarded. Like when they were building horse buggies, their horseless carriages were known for their craftsmanship and high quality. As well regarded as the Patterson automobile was, the success was temporary. A small craftsman automaker like Patterson could not compete with the likes of Henry Ford and his increased mechanization and production lines. Hand-built, high-quality cars weren't able to scale up the way other large manufacturers could. The time and money it took to build a Patterson car just couldn't compete. The profit margin was just too small. That's why I never started a car company. Yeah, that's why I had to shut the doors. Yeah. Well, we, me and me and James started a rival car company, and honestly, mm-hmm. the smear campaigns, we spent a lot of money on that. We should have spent it on production. A lot of money talking crap about each other's non-existent cars. Yeah. People say, i never seen any of these cars. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of like, well, it's probably going to stink. <laughs> that was my... That, yeah, like, our smear campaigns were too good. And- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, that was my car company's slogan. It was just smearing Joe's car company. It didn't say anything about my car. <laughs> mine mine actually like had a couple descriptive things about my car, but then the last four sentences were really defensive. And they were De- like It definitely doesn't stink. Yeah, it doesn't stink and you're <laughs> wrong. <laughs> Joe's car's probably going to stink. If you think my car stinks, you're an idiot. I should have <laughs> taken that out of the copy. Yeah. <laughs> I meant like literally stink. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) He's like sheep leather and I didn't tan it very well. (laughs) Prosciutto leather. (laughs) Prosciutto interior. Oh. Big thanks to Decked for sponsoring this episode of Pass Gas. If you own a truck, you know what it's like to have your stuff rattling around the cab or under the seat or in the bed. And you know what a pain it can be keeping it all organized. Not only that, but everything you put in your truck bed is unsecured and exposed to the elements and to thieves and to anyone who's just walking past your truck. That's why for my truck, I got the decked drawer system. Everyone at decked was so nice and they sent me a a deck system for my 4Runner. It's actually for a a 2018 Tacoma, but it fits my 4Runner beautifully. It's got amazing drawers that pull out and lock and everything. And it makes organizing everything in my 4Runner so easy. Each of Deck's two full bed length drawers can carry up to 200 pounds of whatever you got. That's tools, that's camping equipment, whatever you want. The drawers roll out waist high, giving you easy access to your organized tools and gear. Deck has a true 2,000 pound payload capacity load floor. The drawers slide in underneath the load floor, plus they're weatherproof, protecting your stuff from the elements and theft. It's really an awesome system. I love it so much. Decked also offers a full line of segmented storage organizational accessories like various toolboxes, bags, cargo tie-downs, and other handy items for maximum efficiency both of space and your time. The Decked drawer system is 100% made in the USA and backed by a three-year no-hassle warranty with a second-to-none customer service team ready to answer any question you got. So go get your Decked drawer system at decked.com gas and get free shipping. That's decked.com slash gas for free shipping on your decked drawer system. Decked.com slash gas. Thank you, Decked. Big thanks to our sponsor this week, BetterHelp. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Check out betterhelp.com slash past gas. Life is full of stressors. It doesn't matter who you are or what you have. Your life is probably stressful. You may not be feeling down and out and depressed or like you're at a total loss, but if your stress is high, your temper is shorter than usual, or even if you're starting to feel strain in any of your relationships, you could probably use the chance to unload. Unload the stress and get it out. Talk to someone who's completely unbiased about your life, someone who isn't going to judge you or take sides on anything. When there are things you can't tell anyone or feel like you can't unload to family and friends, you need to unload it. And that's what therapy can be. Therapy is really important. There shouldn't be a stigma around it. Therapy is for everyone and it helps everyone. 
I mean, think about it. You're just talking to someone about your problems. You shouldn't feel ashamed about that. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist. So you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. Everything can be completely anonymous if you want. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy and you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. Unload the stressors and get some unbiased feedback and you'd be pretty surprised at what you might gain from it. See if it's for you. I think therapy is super important. I think it's for everyone. I think everyone can benefit from therapy. What I like the most about BetterHelp is that you don't have to wait in a waiting room. You don't have to set anything up. You just talk to someone online. You can even chat if you want to, if you don't want to be on a camera. Everything's anonymous. Everything's confidential. That's why I like BetterHelp so much. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp and Pass Gas by Donut Media listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash passgas. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash passgas. Thank you, BetterHelp. Uh, by 1918, C.R. Patterson had built around 150 cars, but Patterson halted production on new cars and went back to focusing on repairs. But in the 1920s, the company started making truck and bus bodies to be fitted on chassis made by other manufacturers. And for a while, this made the company profitable. But then in 1929, when the stock market crashed and the Great Depression started, C.R. Patterson had to close up shop. By 1939, Frederick Patterson had to close the company after 74 years of making quality, high-end vehicles. I've never heard of this company. It's crazy that they were around for 74 years. Yeah, wow. As disheartening as the company closing is, the fact that Charles Patterson was born a slave and went on to found the first black automobile company is a feat to be celebrated. And with no surviving Patterson cars today, we just have to assume that they were as high caliber as the history books say. Dang, man. Bus body sounds like a way to describe a person. She got that bus body. <laughs> I feel like I have a bus body. Yeah, you're kind of a bus. We're all bus body boys. We're pretty bus body boys right now. Yeah. Dude, that should be our group. The yeah. bus body boys. The and we should steal the boy. like LeVar Ball uh, <laughs> BBB logo. <laughs> <laughs> bus body boys. Bus body. I feel like we're kind of force fed this rags to riches story in the U.S. a lot where mm -hmm. it's like you you pull up your bootstraps and you can achieve anything. But literally, you like, pull up this your is... bootstraps and, you know, I mean, my dad only owned a di uh, an emerald mine. <laughs> <laughs> and now I go to sp now I got a space program rags to riches. Yeah. But this is literally like bottom as low as you can be born into which is a slave and then become in a business owner that makes like high quality luxury bus bodies bus bodies that's a success for sure absolutely 100%. it wasn't just difficult for black americans to travel by car and to make their own cars they were at a disadvantage if they wanted to sell cars too. enter the first black car dealer homer b roberts roberts was born in 1885 in missouri he graduated from Kansas State uh, Agricultural College and fought in World War I. Roberts made a name for himself well before he started selling cars. In the war, Roberts was the first black man to attain the rank of lieutenant in the United States Army. Dang, wow. dog. This guy oh. does all this stuff. When Roberts returned home, he moved to Kansas City and started selling cars. He saw a market within the African-American community and specifically sold cars to other black Americans. In 1919, that's the year my grandpa was born, Whoa. he put an ad for used cars in the Kansas City Star, the prominent local black newspaper. By the end of that year, he had sold 60 cars, all to black drivers. Robert's business began to take off, and he opened offices, showrooms, and hired salesmen. By 1923, he opened a brand new dealership and named it, fittingly, Robert's Motor Mart. <laughs> Mart is an underutilized word these days. Yeah. Mart. Because of his success, car companies saw the potential of selling specifically to the African American community and backed Roberts dealership. Roberts made franchise deals with Hup Mobile, Rickenbacker, and Oldsmobile. What's a Hup Mobile? It's a it's a car that goes hup up 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 Whoa. It totally looks like one that would do that too. It's cool. It's a cool car. Yeah, I'm gonna get me a 
Nolan's going to restore a Hupmobile. <laughs> the deal with Oldsmobile helped Roberts secure a Ford franchise. The deal meant Roberts was able to run an auto repair shop, parts store, and a 60-car showroom. Then, because of the Great Depression, Roberts was forced to close his dealership in 1929. But before the crash, he had opened and operated not one, but two major car dealerships and showrooms, the first and second black-owned car dealerships in the United States. Roberts is as inspirational as a businessman can get. He wasn't just selling cars. He was selling literal freedom in four-wheeled form to many black customers. Something that kept black people from becoming more involved in car culture in the early days was the fact that for a long time, they were not always allowed to work within the auto industry. In the early decades of the 20th century, they were mostly kept out of Detroit's factories and had trouble getting jobs as mechanics across the country. But one of the first African Americans to design cars actually worked for Ford. Granted, he was an exception, but McKinley Thompson Jr. was a talented designer. I've heard of this dude. McKinley Thompson Jr., called Mac by his friends, was born in 1922 in Queens, New York. Some of his accomplishments include designing the Ford Bronco, the Mustang, Thunderbird, and GT40, and their styles and shapes are recognizable to this day. According to the Henry Ford Museum, Thompson was inspired when he was 12 years old and living in Queens. He saw a 1934 Chrysler Airflow, and he is quoted as saying, There were patchy clouds in the sky. It just so happened that the clouds opened up for the sunshine to come through. I was never so impressed with anything in all my life. I knew that's what I wanted to do in life. I wanted to be an automobile designer. And with that, McKinley was hooked. He spent his whole adult life pursuing and living his dream. First, Thompson trained as an engineering layout coordinator, serving in the Army Signal Corps in World War II. This was a division of the military that developed intelligence and communication technologies. These guys held flags in the... Uh, <laughs> I'm serious. This is, that was how they communicated with other ships and sh they had like oh, flags yeah. and that's where the peace sign comes from. It's like a, it's a, a mix of two different flag signs oh. that mean like no, no nukes and it, it's like one down to the left and one down to the right or something, but it's the peace sign. Interesting. Whoa. Yeah. I like flags a lot. Flag day is probably my favorite holiday. <laughs> By the time he was 30, Thompson still wasn't working with cars, but he wanted to be. So when Motor Trend Magazine held a contest to award four scholarships to the Art Center College of Design in Pasadena, California. Beautiful Ooh, town. Beautiful town. Lots Love of Pasadena. craftsmen. Oh my God, the Yard House in Pasadena is probably the best <laughs> Yard House in all of California. <laughs> I almost moved to Pasadena. <laughs> You're listening to 96.1. It's 5 o'clock. We're getting dirty in the Dina. <laughs> <laughs> the number one station for Pasadena, Monrovia, and Arcadia. Uh, I'm Patty. This is Dina. And this is Pasadena Public Radio. <laughs> uh, sorry. Back to the design uh, scholarship. Thompson applied, and guess what? He freaking won. And he became the first black person to graduate from the school's transportation design department in 1956 at 34 years old. The design he entered that won him the contest was a turbine car with a reinforced plastic body. Damn. That's cool. That's sick. I'm 34 and I've never even heard of a turbine. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't even designed one plastic car. Dude, no, Joe, fuck. you need to get it together, man. Dude, Do you think seriously. Donut would pay for me to go to this college? Probably. Maybe. Maybe. I would, I'd love to. <laughs> <laughs> Matt. <laughs> After graduating from the school in Pasadena, Thompson got a job working for Ford's Advanced Design Studio. Dang, talk about a freaking dream job. One of his first jobs was working on the Gyron, a gyroscopically stabilized two-wheeler. That's cool. Another yeah. project Thompson worked on was a sports utility vehicle, an open-air 4x4 concept featuring a square, short body, and high ground clearance with minimal front and rear overhang for optimum off-road capability. One of Thompson's designs was titled Package Proposal Number 5 for Bronco, which was rendered in 1963. The design would influence the language that would become the first-generation Bronco. I love the first-gen Bronco. It's so cool. Mm -hmm. 
Known then for its unique configuration, it positioned the wheels at far corners of the vehicles and incorporated a boxy and bold attitude. We don't really... The Bronco... Now that the Broncos come back, I think this is more mm-hmm. like in the zeitgeist, but like... Before the new Bronco was announced, like the old Bronco didn't really get its due as like one of the first SUVs, you know? Yeah, it was. They did like, I'm not going to talk, but they did basically just steal the International Scout design. International Harvester. It's pretty close. The The Scout, I think, is a little longer than the Bronco. Um, It does. Yeah, Bronco has a shorter wheelbase, which makes it look fun and sporty. Yeah. I mean, they're both <laughs> rectangles. They're both sick. They're both very they, cool. They both are rectangles. Love that Scout. Do you, sick. Look at this description for a Gyron. It, I don't understand anything that they're saying. All right, a Gyron is a triangular heraldic ordinary having an angle at the fest point and the opposite side at the edge of the X. Gucian. A shield divided into gyrons is called gyrony. <laughs> the default is typically of eight if no number of gyrons is specified. The word gyron is derived from old French giron, meaning gusset. What like, don't what you is understand a gusset? about that? What don't you understand about that? I don't understand one word. I know I what a triangle is. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, yeah. Gyron. I mean, it's that broke my brain. Yeah, that car that he designed is sick, though. I like that. Reading that, I felt like I was having a stroke. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Big thanks to Upstart for sponsoring this episode of Pass Gas. I know a lot of you are probably in debt like I was. I still have a, a little bit of debt, but it's more under control now. But in my 20s, I was just going crazy with my credit card. I had an outstanding balance month after month that just kept growing and I felt like I was underwater. If you dread looking at your credit card statements, you're not alone. Debt can feel crippling, but Upstart can help you on your path to financial freedom. Upstart is the fast and easy way to pay off your debt with a personal loan. Everything's online, very easy. Whether it's paying off credit cards, consolidating high interest debt, or funding personal expenses, over half a million people have used Upstart to get one fixed monthly payment. Upstart knows you're more than just your credit score and is expanding access to affordable credit. Unlike other lenders, Upstart considers your income and current employment to find you a smarter rate for your loan. With a five minute online rate check, you can see your rate upfront for loans between $1,000 to $50,000. You can receive funds as fast as one business day after accepting your loan. I really like Upstart because they consolidate everything and make it so easy to pay off your debt. It really could have helped me in my worst times. So find out how Upstart can lower your monthly payments today when you go to upstart.com slash gas. That's upstart.com slash gas. Don't forget to use our URL to let them know we sent you. Loan amounts will be determined based on your credit, income, and certain other information provided in your loan application. Go to upstart.com slash gas. Thank you, Upstart. Big thanks to Valvoline for sponsoring this episode of Past Gas. Valvoline is the original motor oil. Not only were they the first patented motor oil brand, but they've also had many firsts in the industry. Like the first high mileage oil, the first synthetic blend, and the first racing oil. And ever since they patented the original motor oil, they have not stopped innovating. They're constantly reinventing formulas to provide the ultimate protection for every engine on the road today. In fact, every motor oil Valvoline makes has recently been reformulated to provide 40% better wear protection than industry standards. It's proven to maximize engine life by fighting the four main causes of engine breakdown. Those are heat, friction, wear, and deposits. But there's another reason we love Valvoline. They're synonymous with some of the racing greats like Kale Yarborough, AJ Foyt, Chase Elliott, and Mark Martin. And soon you're gonna add my name to that list because I use Valvoline in my car. I drive really fast. I never have to worry about oil because Valvoline is so great. So watch out, Chase Elliott. And do yourself a favor and make sure you choose Valvoline. Head over to valvoline.com slash original to find the right oil for your engine. Thank you, Valvoline. Uh, oh, by, and by the way, the Bronco launched a 30-year run that saw over 1.1 million examples sold. Good job, Thompson. Outside of working for Ford, McKinley Thompson tried to create his own dream car. He rented a garage in Detroit from 1969 to 1979. He and his friend Wallace Triplett, the first African-American draftee to play for the Detroit Lions, by the way, 
worked on creating and building a prototype car. They pitched this prototype to automakers and developing nations, but were never able to sell his design. He eventually stopped working on this project, but continued to work at Ford until 1984 when he retired. Many of his designs still influence Ford to this day, including the new Bronco, which I I don't think I've seen the new Bronco in person yet. I've seen a lot of those Bronco sports around selling. I've very seen well. a lot of Bronco sports. Is that on a different platform or? Yeah, those Bronco sports, those are on the Ford Escape platform, and that's going to be the oh, same thing okay. that the Maverick uh, uses as well. The Bronco proper platform is its entirely own design. And for me personally, if I get a new car, it's between. Mm-hmm. The new Z, if that's if yeah. that's affordable, realistic, yeah. If that's realistic, new Z, uh, the new GR eighty six, or mm. the Bronco. Those are great choices. I think that's a cool little triplet to. Yeah, not bad. That's a cool little gyron to pick from. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. such a gyron. That's a great <laughs> gyron to pick from. African American contribution to the car culture doesn't stop with being manufacturers and dealers. If it weren't for a prominent black inventor, we wouldn't have the modern traffic light. Garrett Morgan was an inventor who worked on everything from hair straighteners to sewing machines. Morgan was born in 1877, and by the 1920s, he already had several patents from his inventions. After patenting several inventions, including working on a gas mask, Morgan turned his attention to the road. Morgan was the first black man to own a car in Cleveland, Ohio. His interest in cars and his skills as an inventor led him to develop a friction drive clutch. Next, he created a new traffic signal, one that warned drivers to stop with an automatic light, so essentially our modern traffic light. It was such a success that Morgan got the patent for the light and eventually sold the rights to General Electric for 40 grand. It was such an important invention that Morgan was honored and recognized for his traffic light invention by the U.S. government before his death. Dude, imagine a world without traffic lights. Chaos. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just thinking about driving down Figaro and hitting every single red light. <laughs> just like 15 in a row. So, I mean, great. Great for safety. <laughs> Horrible for your time management. Yeah. <laughs> I, love, I love green lights. I'll go on record saying that. Green lights. Yellow, baby. (laughs) I like to feel something when I drive. (laughs) If the Green Book was all about giving African Americans freedom to travel the country, what did African Americans do when it came to car racing? They weren't allowed to race in the Indy 500 or NASCAR because of segregation. But there are plenty of black Americans who were interested in racing and were talented drivers. So what did they do? In 1924, a group of black drivers and mechanics decided to start the Colored Speedway Association. The inaugural event for the group was held at the Indianapolis State Fairgrounds, One Mile Dirt Oval. The race was part of the city's Emancipation Day celebration on August 2, 1924. In fact, the race was advertised in black newspapers, saying it was, quote, the only event staged exclusively for men of our race. The race had entrance of all skill and mechanical levels. One driver had to tow his car by rope behind his Model T Ford. I guess instead of like having like a flatbed to load it on. Meanwhile, I was about to say just just drive the just drive the Ford in the race. <laughs> <laughs> but you clarified. Meanwhile, a driver by the name of Wild Bill Jeffries raced in a twelve thousand dollar Frontenac racer worth about one hundred seventy thousand dollars in today's money. A more typical example of a CSA driver was Charlie Wiggins. He was born in 1897 in Evansville, Indiana. When his mother died, Charlie started shoe shining to help support his family. He learned the mechanics of cars because where he shined shoes was outside of an auto dealership. He would watch through the open doors of dealership service shops. In 1917, he was able to convince the dealership to give him an apprenticeship with the mechanics. That's cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Wiggins eventually became one of the lead technicians, even though all the other men who worked there were white. In 1922, Wiggins moved to Indianapolis, where he got a job as a head mechanic at an auto repair garage and eventually bought the business when the owner retired. Armed with his knowledge of the inner workings of cars, Wiggins decided to build his own race car in his spare time. Between working and running an auto shop, he built the car he named the Wiggins Special, using spare parts he salvaged from local junkyards. In 1925, Charlie entered the Wiggins Special into the Gold and Glory Sweepstakes Race, a major race hosted by the Colored Speedway Association. The race was a 100-lap dirt race 
held on a one-mile oval at the Indiana State Fairground. Writer Dale Drennan described it as a, quote, brutal event, victory in which conferred the moral equivalent of a victory in the Indy 500. In his first Golden Glory sweepstakes, Wiggins ran with the leaders of the race but suffered an engine failure, unfortunately. But in 1926, Wiggins returned, entering a full season of the CSA races. He was the breakout star of the season, winning Golden Glory by two full laps. Wow. Wow. Even though Wiggins was excluded from the Indy 500 because of his race, his reputation as a talented driver and mechanic came to the attention of a white driver, Bill Cummings. In 1934, Cummings helped Wiggins to tune up his car for the Indy 500 that year. However, because of Jim Crow laws, Wiggins had to pretend to be a janitor to get into the race. Good God. Oh my God. Come on. He worked as a janitor during the day and as a mechanic for Cummings at night. Thanks to Wiggins' help, Cummings won Indy that year in what must have been a bittersweet victory for the black mechanic who helped him get there, but was excluded himself. Talent was not the issue. Wiggins was an incredibly talented driver. In 1927, Wiggins won a race in Quakertown, Pennsylvania on a one-mile dirt oval. His average speed was 81.6 miles per hour. Just a week earlier, the white IndyCar driver Frank Lockhart had set the one-mile dirt track record at 82.826 miles per hour. To come that close to the record in a homemade car built with junkyard parts is pretty damn incredible. In 1936, Wiggins' own career as a driver ended on his second lap in the Gold and Glory race. He was in a collision when another driver lost control of their car, which caused a 13-car accident. Wiggins lost an eye and a leg in the accident. But ever the bad Mm. Wiggins made himself a wooden peg leg and continued to fight for black participation in racing and mentoring young black drivers all the way up to his death in 1979. Damn. Good long life. Freaking making it happen, man. Yeah. That's so awesome. That's It's it's just like a dude who Mm. loves what he's doing. Nothing's going to stop him, and he just kind of made his dreams come true yeah absolutely dang that thing must have been race cars back then were terrifying yes you yeah have these skinny tires probably less than six inches wide you're sitting like directly behind the motor you can barely see over the the hood no seat belt no nothing yeah. you're wearing a flight cap as a helmet yeah mm-hmm. Good maybe Lord, like man. slight leather like it, it evolved from just a flag cap to just this, like, kind of hard leather. Yeah, just amazing. And every every race car was called, like, the something special. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or the, the death machine. No bolsters. No bolsters on the seats. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, man. The last issue of the Green Book was published in 1966, two years after the Civil Rights Act passed in 1964. The end of the book's publication was what Victor Hugo Green wanted all along, for his guidebook to finally become obsolete and unnecessary. But driving while black is still fraught with injustice. America still has a long way to go. Even to this day, there's not been another black-owned car company. And some even claim Henry Ford stole some of his designs from C.R. Patterson. And the legacy of many of these talented businessmen, drivers, and designers are still not as well-known as they should be. The first black NASCAR driver wasn't until Wendell Scott, uh, who we actually covered on this show. Definitely go give that a listen. The first black man didn't get behind the wheel of a Formula One car until 1986 with Willie T. Ribs. Ribs was also the first black man to drive in the Indy 500, and that wasn't until 1991. Wow. But even with these obstacles, black Americans persisted. They bought cars and drove them. They built cars, sold cars, designed cars, and raced cars. The automobile is a symbol of freedom for all of us, but for black Americans, it wasn't just a symbol. It provided real freedom that they weren't being granted by a segregated society. Here's to them and their inspiring stories. Here, here. Yeah, man, like there is that distinction. We always hear it like, oh, like once a a, a teenager gets a car, it gives them freedom, you know, but really it's more, really just gives them independence from their parents, right? Real freedom is what we described in this episode. I think that's an an important distinction to have in your in your mind. Yeah, we take a lot of things for granted and I feel like I don't want to be that guy to be like kids are spoiled nowadays, but like 
But they are. But they are. <laughs> Zillennials. <laughs> <laughs> there was nothing to say after that. So, um, I mean, these, these dudes are super inspiring and even like Cheryl glass, like for her to fight her way, we didn't talk about her in this episode because I think she deserves her own episode, mm-hmm. but Cheryl glass had, you know, not only the race barrier to break through, but also being a female in a male dominated sport is very hard. These people have a lot more courage than I do. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, that does it for this episode of Past Gas. Thank you very much for listening. Big shout out to Gretchen Soren, author of Driving While Black, African-American Travel and the Road to Civil Rights. Uh, if you are still want, if you want to know more about the subjects we covered in this book, check out that book. Give it a read. If you have any uh, corrections or comments, questions or suggestions, hit us up at pastgas at donutmedia.com. We'd love to hear from you. And maybe we'll read your email on this show. If we mispronounced anything, don't hold back. We love doing that kind of stuff. Uh, if you like this podcast, tell a friend and maybe uh, follow it or subscribe to it. It's free. Word of mouth is still the best way to uh, promote podcasts. So. Yeah. I suggest saying, have you heard? And then say past gas. Yeah. Have you heard past gas, the history automotive history podcast from Donut Media? And hopefully they say, yeah, I love it. But if they haven't, say, you should really check it out. It's good. It's a good listen. It's pretty good. Like, the guys, they're, like, pretty funny. They're kind of funny. <laughs> they're kind of funny in, like, a, you know, like, West Coast elite I way. think TJ Miller. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks for listening. You can check out our YouTube channel, Donut Media. Follow us on social media at Donut Media. Follow Joe at Joe G. Weber. Follow Nolan at Nolan J. Sykes. Follow me at James Pumphrey. I love you. Bye.